I'll say something about the how we start, and that would help you also as panelists just to, to see where this might land. Uh, we see any has struggled to connect, we'll start with her straight away to allow her to tell something of her story, how she ended up in Bible translation. Uh, I will do a brief introduction of her. There would be one or two questions to her, and then we'll move to Daniel and to Dr. Lenell and Prof. Ernst, so each one. But uh, then in the end, you're welcome to respond to what you heard your colleagues say, but in the end, we will have open questions to anyone. So in that order, you would see in his uh, lovely picture there, a mother of six in Bible translation in Nigeria. Any, would you please tell us how did you tell us something of your your life story, and with a focus on the theme of the day, Bible translation, tell us how this journey led to Bible translation. We'll give you four or so, four or five minutes just to share. It's a self introduction. It's also in, an introduction of our theme for the day. Most welcome. Okay, um, I should say when I was growing up uh, as a child, there was this um. The gospel of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John translated into Luca. Luca is my mother tongue. So I I was able to read, even when I was a child, I was able to read the the those the copies of those uh, the gospels. So I didn't know God was preparing for something bigger. I I I never knew about, I never thought about it. But then many, many years ago, as an adult. After my computer training, Daniel, I'll ask you. Uh, we we really pray that we will have any back, and at one point we would um, slaughter in. Thanks for understanding, Daniel. Just tell us where on earth is the Gambia, uh, and I think very few in the audience have been there. So just give us a little uh, geography lesson. Um, the Gambia is in far west Africa, just near, just by the sea. I've uh, been here working with the with the Fula community, trying to produce some uh, uh, oral Bible stories. Um, it, this one is uh, less technical than uh, the right, uh, reaching translation. Um, just getting some groups of people and training them to produce oral Bible stories and tell them all around. And it's a, a, a wonderful work here too. So Daniel, can you tell us what is oral Bible translation? Because you don't only work on it, you're also a consultant and a trainer. So for those who don't understand the technicalities, what is oral Bible translation? All right. Um, we have uh, two kinds of uh, oral Bible translations, the oral Bible storytelling and then oral Bible translation itself. Um, many people are aware of uh, uh, audio Bible, which is usually a recording of uh, a written translation. Um, oral Bible translation is different from that. It's a kind of uh, translating from oral into oral, um, a kind of uh, getting already recorded uh, Bible in English, for example, a recorded NIV, uh, NLT, CEV, and others, and using them as resources to translate into uh, another language still in oral. Uh, that is also less technical than uh, the written translation you know we don't have to do all the linguistic stuff uh, uh, analyzing uh, the phonetics and uh, the, the the phonology and all that bringing out a, a writing system in a language developing an orthography and doing literacy classes because uh, we just have to uh, get the audio of a written Bible and then use it as a resource to uh, to translate orally um, into another language. And we have uh, um, an app produced by Faith Comes by Hearing uh, called Render. We use that app to do it. All the uh, resources are uploaded into the Render app and uh, they are available there. And uh, the translators use that to make their own uh, 
translations and then all the steps involved in oral Bible translation have to be observed there. We have the, the, the translators play their own role and then uh, the bar translators, community checkers, they all use the render app to do their work. And then the consultant also checks using the same app and all the corrections are done orally. And besides that, we also have the oral Bible storytelling. Uh, that one is uh, less, uh, it's, more simp it's, 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 it's simpler than, uh, than the oral Bible translation because we simply pick a very short story. Uh, for example, the story of Abraham's call, uh, then craft it into a story, just the way uh, African communities used uh, to tell stories. Uh, you remember how uh, grandparents will tell stories to their grandchildren at night, sitting down and relaxing. So we're trying to revive that kind of culture by crafting uh, Bible stories, you know, those kind of uh, fables, all those traditional stories that we used to hear. The people knew them offhand. They don't have to read it. It stays in their memory. So when the story is crafted, then it, it is internalized and people can tell it freely. So that is the aspect of uh, oral Bible storytelling. Uh, the crafters at the same time, uh, uh, also the, uh, the, the storytellers, after crafting the stories, they move around in their communities telling the stories and they expect the people they're telling those stories to continue to tell the stories to other people also. So the word of God is being sprayed in story forms. Lunel, I'm going to ask you the same question. It's just fascinating that someone growing up on the other side of the globe in the US, you end up spending your professional life in Africa and you in Bible translation. Is it possible for you to, in a short, uh, just a summary fashion, just tell us something about yourself and what brought you to Bible translation and to Africa. We'd love to see your camera if that's possible. Thanks, welcome, Dr. Lunel Zogbu. After I became a Christian in my late teens, I was always interested in French and linguistics. And I made a trip through a summer uh, church program to go to Haiti where I worked at a radio station and was involved in translating um, daily devotionals into French. And this was a turning point in my life uh, where I wanted to get more involved in Bible translation. And I ended up going to West Africa, first with uh, Wycliffe Bible translators, where I lived in a small village among the Godier people, um, 18,000 speakers, learning the language, doing the alphabet, doing the linguistic analysis in a people that had very little contact with the gospel. I then left um, that work and did my doctoral studies and went back with United Bible Societies um, to work in West Africa, where I worked in, I'm now retired, but I worked in Burkina Faso, in Mali, Liberia, Togo, Benin, and Ivory Coast, um, training Bible translators, mother tongue Bible translators, and also working on helps in French for um, the Francophone region of Africa. Thank you so much. I'm going to put you on hold there. If you don't mind any, you back. Let's get the next um, attempt. At the moment we talk, then sometimes something happens and you disappear. Are you, are you back online, Any? Can we hear you this time? I'm back online. Yes, please proceed. Tell us your story. Okay, I joined the Bible translation in 2011. And that was after, let's say in 2009, I went to um, Calabar to do a diploma in computer studies. So when I was done with uh, my studies over there, 
the chef, the dead chairman of local Bible translation project called me. He said I should come and join the translators. But when I told this to my other brother, because I was in his house, he said, no, you can't go back to the village. You have to stay here in the city and get a, a good job doing. What will you end in the village? Stay here. So it was over three weeks. We kept debating. I kept talking to him. But throughout these three weeks, I had no peace of mind. Even if I sleep, I was just lying down. And it seems there we've lost our dear sister. I would take chapters as it comes. Uh, um, Dr. Linnell, can I ask you, just give us a picture of the languages of West Africa. I think few people know how complex that is. Could you give us a short, just a view of languages in, in your area? In my area, all the languages belong to the Niger-Congo family which is a huge um, linguistic family divided up into many different uh, subgroups. And um, the languages are uh, countries may have many different language linguistic groups and lang countries have many more languages than you would imagine so that in Nigeria, some people are estimating 500. In Cameroon, there are over 300. Where I live and work in Ivory Coast, there are over 60 languages. And of course, some of those are major and some of those are spoken by less numbers of people. Some of those are vehicular languages, so they're spoken by many different peoples. We have much bilingualism, so people speak many languages. Um, I will note that in Bible translation began earlier, much earlier, in the Anglophone part of West Africa in the 1800s. So we have more Bible translations and older Bible translations in those regions. And in Francophone Africa, this is a really recent development and there's a very big uh, challenge to cover these many languages. It's also a challenge um, from a sociolinguistic point of view to try and see which languages and which dialects will be most efficient in um, as communication vehicles for the word of God. Thank you so much. So it seems like God in his wisdom allowed the need for languages. The Bible of Africa is in, in West Africa <laughs> because that's where the big need is for. We have the languages, but they also need the Bible. And quite often, like in the, above the, um, uh, the Sahel, these are mostly Muslim areas. So that makes it even more challenging. I would just see um, take one chance more for any. I saw your message, any. Are you online? And if so, can we get another small chapter of your story? If you've just been to Nigeria and you know where she lives and the challenges of connection and even the threats to life in the north, you would understand this brave woman, a mother of six, who has made a life choice of focusing on Bible translations. So she's a hero already. And uh, the rest is waiting. Prof. Ernst, just bring us in the picture. Is there a need for Bible translation in Southern Africa as well? Could you just expand a bit on that? Uh, the language situ situation in our part of the world, well, we've had a rather long history uh, of Bible translation moving up from South Africa and the influ influence of the Bible Society of South Africa uh, uh, and the United Bible Societies working in uh, my part of Africa. Uh, and when I was a consultant, I was working in Zambia, uh, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. I know the situation there in terms of number of languages more than in other areas. Uh, in Zambia, we have probably about 25 to 30 distinct language uh, languages, depending on how you classify them. In Malawi, uh, less, probably about 20, 15 to 20, Zimbabwe about the same. 
uh, I'm not a classifier of languages. I, I don't. So in that sense, my, my figures may be wrong. But I think the, the main translation challenge that we're facing in this part of the world is um, having completed um, two translations in most of the major languages of this region that is an older missionary translation followed by uh, a, a somewhat uh, more dynamic equivalence or meaning-based translation in most of the, I think almost all of the major languages of this region do have at least two uh, Bible translations. But the tra uh, challenge now I think for us is to move into study Bibles and to, to uh, provide uh, Bibles uh, not only with the text but also with uh, sufficient annotation that would give readers uh, a contextual background to help them understand the text. Because in this part of the world, there are not a lot of written uh, resources available uh, in theology or Bible, uh, even in some of the major languages in the vernacular. Uh, in, in the vernacular, So a study Bible project, I think, in all of these languages, major ones, would be a very important task. I was involved in two uh, New Testament projects in, in Zambia and Malawi, uh, but then the interest sort of died down having produced those two, although I do think they are quite uh, uh, widely received, the uh, study Bible of the New Testament in Chichewa and in Chitonga of Zambia. But uh, for me, that would be the, the big challenge is to move on from the Bible translation to provide the study Bible types uh, type of materials for the for the local pastors who really have no access uh, other than the Bible with notes or anything in the vernacular uh, in terms of study material to help them contextualize the text and uh, present the message more accurately. Thank you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Dr. Lennell. Um, together with Prof. Ernst, you've trained hundreds, I would believe, people from Africa and elsewhere in Bible translation. So uh, just on behalf of our two colleagues who struggle to connect, just tell us what does it cost for them to, to move from deep rural Africa to travel all the way to meet you in Jerusalem or elsewhere where you offer your Bible translation? What, and what brings them back? How is it possible that people um, can make so many sacrifices for God's word? Would you give us just a, a glimpse there, please? Yes, um, the the challenge and the sacrifices are huge on the part of African Bible translators. Um, years ago, we, in the beginning, had people with very low education. And so we would bring them together into workshops in uh, major cities so people would have to travel and um, leave their home you know their homes and come to capital cities for um, various translation and um, at that time in my uh, time of service many translators only had a high school education so there was no um, mother there was no knowledge of hebrew or greek very little background theologically often what we call secondary translations coming out of the um you know either from french or english which of course is not a very high quality nowadays we are trying to have very much higher uh trained people and so this does mean that people have to move around quite a bit. Um, Ernst and I have been involved in teaching in Jerusalem where Bible translators now have the chance uh, to travel to Jerusalem to see the actual geography, to learn Hebrew um, in a far better way. Um, and uh, and this is these are challenges but they're also welcome. Um, people love doing this and moving, though they do have to leave their families behind. Um, on another level, there are great sacrifices when people commit 
to Bible translation. And I think uh, Annie was beginning to try and say how her brothers were telling her, you have a degree in computer science. What are you doing in Bible translation? So the challenge, there's a huge challenge for the church to recognize Bible translators as part of the ministry, for them to have the status and role that they need. There is um, underpayment and also great difficulty in how to integrate a Bible translator into a community, into a church, um, and also what happens to a Bible translator when they get done with their Bible translation. So the Bible translators that I know have given up good paying jobs, uh, living in better conditions to sacrifice, to carry out the job of Bible translation for their people. And it's a call. Uh, and they need training, everyone needs training, but no one can really do this work without a call. Thank you so much. Prof. Aaron's on the same topic. Um, I have once visited a group of those Bible translators and consultants in training in Israel, and uh, it I didn't find you there that time, but I think you've been there possibly uh, not you have been there many times there's a community there's a it's almost like a, a fellowship and friendship developing around these guys living together studying god's word visiting the land so just tell us what that does to connect bible translators as a profession and i i would assume keeping um, lines of communication open to support one another to encourage just something if you add to Dr. Linnell's just sharing of the Bible translation community, especially the African leaders. Um, yes, the, the uh, ability or the opportunity to study together uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in the land uh, as a community of, I forget how many was the, was the largest group that we had, between 15 and 20 uh, translation consultants. We are focusing on especially after the first group that we trained in the Psalms, uh, we're working uh, with especially newer translation consultants or those in training, but to work together with them uh, to build a community and a fellowship uh, working uh, with especially biblical Hebrew poetry and then with a focus on a particular book. Uh, it, it's been a wonderful experience and then having this background in the land to see the text uh, uh, visualized in, in person as we translate uh, these books is something that cannot be, uh, you can't duplicate that with pictures on a page or e even movies, uh, videos or whatever. But then we try to cooperate in other projects. We try to uh, work together with the, the group that we have participants in producing a, a, a study, uh, a booklet of study papers that we collect and uh, working together on that as a group is also something that binds them together and uh, forms relationships that I think uh, carry on after we uh, complete the course. Uh, we know each other, different parts of the world. In fact, the last course that unfortunately we had to teach uh, via Zoom, uh, we had participants ranging from uh, one in America to the other in China. So we had uh, nine participates, participants all over the world. Now that adds another dimension, not only Africa, we had several participants from Africa, but then uh, getting to know uh, people from other parts of the world, the Far East, then the, the, the folks in Africa uh, realized that, well, the, the problems that we were facing are not only those in Africa, but they're facing the same types of problems in, in China, in, uh, in, in Thailand, in Korea, and, and elsewhere. So that's a a broadening experience that also contributes to understanding the fellowship of Bible translation coming also from different organizations, not only UBS or SIL, but there are other organizations that are involved. And for at, on the organizational level too, I think this is a big, a big plus when we're able to work together on different projects and train um, uh, the next generation of translation consultants 
I think that's uh, something that Linnell and I have been uh, wanting to focus on in, in all of our uh, uh, courses. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Prof. Ernst. Um, I'm, I see any is back with us, any. Um, sometimes when when I catch you there and then are you are you still yeah please just continue we have another short episode <laughs> you've been lost and you've been found you are with people who love the Lord and love the Bible and who love Bible translation so you've found, been found in the right place I see Daniel has also joined us uh, just continue something about your story we still with a question how a woman with your talents and responsibilities would um, end up with Bible translation. What do you enjoy? Just just talk to us. Okay. Uh, I What I enjoy in Bible translation is that it, it kind of gives me relief to see people, even those who are being called the minority languages, to have access to the word of God in their own mother tongue. Some in oral or dice orally and some through text. So you 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 that is I like it when I see people feel happy that oh so God can speak my language so God can understand my language it gives me that joy so I, I I'm always that is one of the things that make me that gives me joy in Bible translation and also it is not limited to just maybe a certain class of people, but people of all classes, both old and young, rich and poor, and even those living in suburb areas that are not accounted for nothing. They have access. Because of Bible translation, they have access to God's word. So uh, because they power in the word of God, it can liberate, can give joy. So it gives me joy that, you see, God is not... Um, is not <laughs> it's not partial you can even use women girls some boys of course my sister now you must preach but just to give us a context bible translation in northern nigeria we get shocking messages news bulletins about almost the ethnic cleansing of of anyone not but faith cleansing in the north so how does that affect your vision and your work of bible translation in the north Okay, now I'm in the south. After finishing school, I left Joss and came back home. That was since April. But one, some of the challenges I've, I discovered when I was in Joss was that sometimes it is difficult to go out as a Bible translator. For instance, there are places you don't go to do Bible translation because it is um, sometimes a Muslim-dominated area. And there was a time when um, some of my colleagues came back to school and one of them told me, the only thing I have now is my laptop. Every other of my thing has been burnt up. So more many translators in the North are facing challenges. Challenges from the Muslims and some those kind of things. So, and in the South here, yeah, like, from my experience, I've been working with a cluster called the Ekpeye Cluster. It is in the River State and um, Bayelsa State in the eastern Nigeria. One of the challenges they are facing there is, is flood. It was horrible and sorrowful when we went there April and they showed us the water level right inside their homes. It, it, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, it was. Thank you so much, Eni. Can I speak to our audience for a second? You would see the public chat is open, so if you want to type comments or questions to our panelists, you're welcome. Daniel, I'm moving to you. There's a question from Christopher to ask whether people receive um, oral Bible translations as give them the same authority as the written one. So you were still busy. Um, welcome us welcoming us into the world of all Bible translation. You're welcome to proceed, but please also respond to Christopher's question. Thank you. Yeah, oral Bible translation is accepted as uh, authoritative, but it also has its own challenges. Um, the challenge with uh, oral Bible translation is that uh, 
uh, it's a little bit difficult for uh, a pastor to have it and read it out in church, but then it makes it easy for people to listen to it at homes uh, during their devotions. And uh, if uh, a pastor were to uh, read out scripture in church, then uh, they probably has to have a very good public address system and be able to select from uh, the lots of uh, uh, audio files to get which particular one he wants to play. So that is a challenge with uh, oral Bible translation, but then the content of, uh, uh, of, of the material, the text itself is the same, uh, whether oral or written, uh, there is no difference. So it is accepted as Bible, but then that is just a challenge. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump to Dr. Linnell to ask you, what is it that you enjoy in Bible translation? Are you not thinking of retirement and staying in the uh, where you are at the moment? What brings you back to African Bible translation every time? Uh, Dr. Michelle Kenmonier, who's head of Wycliffe Bible Translators now, or SIL, excuse me, president from Cameroon, says Linnell is retired, but she's not tired. And um, I have to say that the field is so fascinating. The challenges are so great. The need is so deep. And I love this work. Um, er Ernst and I have been involved in many projects recently, teaching one book workshops, working on Hebrew poetry, and our vision has been to improve Bible translations by letting people use stylistic devices in their own languages to and in their own music and their own cultural forms to make the word of God more alive, um, more poetic, more song-like, especially um, the third of the New Old Testament that is poetic. So it is a kind of driving passion that will not let me stop in my own personal life and um, I probably Ernst would agree with me on that. I want to I want to turn to him, but I want to make it difficult. Prof. Ernst, have you ever seen a translation of Shakespeare? And if people can't translate Shakespeare, what makes you think that we can translate <laughs> biblical poetry? Because I mean, it's so complicated. Uh, to be more fair, what have you learned uh, in terms of the secrets of getting biblical ancient poetry speak to modern people in Africa? Okay, I know. Yeah, uh, one of my first uh, experiences in uh, the translation of Shakespeare was uh, some work that was done by my friend and colleague uh, Philip Noss in, um, in, uh, in Kenya. And um, the uh, Julius Nyerere had done quite a bit of translation of, uh, of, of Shakespeare into poetic form. I think he called it the Tenzi form of uh, sort of Arabic related Swahili poetry. And that got me interested. Well, if you can translate uh, Shakespeare in poetry, why not uh, biblical poetry? And uh, I think the, the, the motivating factor here, I, I think uh, with Linnell and I studying, uh, focusing our courses on biblical Hebrew poetry, once you see the beauty and the power of the original text, and then you look at the translations and how all that beauty and power has been washed out, you say, well, th the meaning, a certain aspect of meaning has been lost from the biblical text. So what can we do uh, to uh, build that back into our translations? And it is possible and it doesn't take long for I think mother tongue translators like uh, Daniel and Victoria who are in our class to uh, catch the idea and the vision after just a, a course of several weeks and then to be able to produce translations in a poetic form and often also in a musical form in their language. Uh, and once they 
uh, capture uh, that that vision and are motivated by that, then then you're on the way because you can't turn back then to an ordinary translation, having experienced the the beauty of the biblical text in another language, especially if it's in your mother tongue. So for me, that has been the, uh, the the driving force. You look at the original, you see what's there. Okay, how can we reproduce some of that? You can never reproduce everything. Uh, we yes, the content is very important. But it isn't all that difficult with uh, competent translators, not only in Greek and Hebrew, but especially in my, my experience, having uh, mother tongue translators who are experts in their own languages. Once they get the the idea to produce wonderful poetry in, in their in their mother tongue, and uh, then uh, the fire has been lit, and and they're off, as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Linnell, I'll ask you soon, I'll first get to Reverend Daniel, but I'll ask you if uh, Prof. Ernst didn't go, go off the rails when his translation includes dances and, you know, funny things in church. Uh, is that really part of translating the Bible? But I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about that. Uh, sorry, Prof. Ernst, for putting you on the spot. Uh, Reverend Daniel, there's a question uh, from Kirang. Ayuga, my understanding is that oral features of English are different from the receptors. How do you navigate through these two, world, two worlds to make sure the product is natural in this receptor language? Now, it seems like the question assumes that you translate via English. Maybe there are other ways of doing it. So just help us on in response to that question, please. Yeah, um, it is very, very clear. Uh, you know, the, the translators use uh, English resources, actually they are from uh, Anglophone uh, communities, so they use English. Now, as they translate, they do not think in terms of English, you know, automatically, since they are not doing a written translation, is if one is doing a written translation, the, the tendency to want to copy the discourse structure of English is always there. But uh, in the oral, um, people don't think about the words. They think about the meaning of what they have gotten from the, from the, the text that they have listened to. So it is much easier to uh, incorporate features of uh, the, 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 the target language uh, instead of uh, uh, the features of uh, the, the source language. And uh, the internalization process in uh, OBT or OBS makes it easy for the translators to, to, to do that. And uh, having been through written translation and also involved in the oral translation, now I've really been thinking that uh, the, the, the internalization process that is done in oral Bible translation needs to be incorporated in written back, uh, Bible translation just to enhance naturalness in uh, reaching uh, Bible translation. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Daniel. I see our sister Annie is back. So any your response or just continue another snippet of your story and your experience, please talk to us. When we see you online, we want to hear more. Since I joined Intel last year, October, I, apart from being the project programs manager, I've, I've been also uh, taking part in OBS. Like yeah, I'm being trained as an OBS, one of the OBS facilitators. Seems that we've lost our sister again. We will take our chance whenever I see her here. Dr. Linnell, <clears throat> um, what we're getting to is performance, that translation involves singing, rhythm, dancing. So I was a bit naughty with my question. Just help us how you and Prof. Aarons use those or encourage those in translating biblical poetry. Thanks. Okay, well, um, one way that we can go about this is have translators analyze their own genre and their own songs. So we would try and get features of a praise song in a given language, of a lament song in a given language. And then when we are translating, we try and 
encourage translators and the consultants to help the translators incorporate the features of the genre into their text, their written text. Now, there are many ways to go about performance, and Daniel's talking about coming from the other end of ha start, starting with oral. And the other way is to start with the written text, which is a product of deep exegesis and study of stylistic features, both of the Hebrew and the target language, to produce a poetic version that can be sung. Um, and I want to emphasize that as translation consultants, our job is to ensure that the text is not uh, messed up, that through this attempt to get aesthetically pleasing lines, that we are faithful to the Hebrew source text. Now, and then what happens after that in performance is a feature will be depend on the context. Um, many of these song performance um, packages have been done in the context of traumatic healing, where people um, even write their own psalms, they read their psalms, they sing their psalms, they do drama of their psalms, and they dance their psalms. And this brings about healing in many um, different contexts. So there are different ways we we let go of it once it gets into the dance realm. That is for each culture to decide how that should be carried out. But our job as translation consultants is to get to a product which will inspire and speak to people in a way that's close to their culture and their linguistic and, and poetic forms. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof. Adams, you're welcome to, to add on if you want. I put you on the spot in terms of just the performance, but please also uh, respond to Dr. Tesfa Jakob's question. He heads uh, into the denominational Bible translation organization in Ethiopia, and he asks you about quality. How do we determine the quality of a translation and maybe implied is how he would he know as coordinator which of the existing translations need improvement in quality? So th maybe that's a question you want to respond to. Yes, quality and quality control is a very important aspect uh, of Bible translation. Uh, the problem is if you try to determine the quality of a translation after you're already done with it, that, that's really too late. Uh, really, you should be testing your uh, product from the very beginning. Many of the early translations that I was involved with began with the Gospel of Mark in this part of the world, the, uh, the uh, more meaning-based translation. And the first thing we would do then is to circulate uh, drafts of that uh, translation among the community, the churches, and to try to get feedback right from an early stage uh, to see, are we on the right track? Is this too dynamic? Are there problems with key terms and so forth that the churches will have to sort out among themselves? Because we, uh, in this part of the world, uh, we were all in, we were involved with ecumenical translations. That is, we were involved with all the churches, not only Protestants, but the Catholics as well. And there you have some, some huge uh, differences uh, and these uh, key terms. If you if you mistranslate a key term, uh, it, the people will reject the translation because of one one word uh, or a phrase that they don't agree with. Especially if it's one that is repeated uh, th in many parts of the Bible, they will re reject the translation because of that one issue. So, translation checking and testing has to go hand in hand from beginning to end, and the more people that you can get involved from the grassroots to scholars and uh, uh, church leaders involved in that profit process, the more likelihood it will be that the version that you're working on will be acceptable at the end of the day. You're not gonna have 100% approval 
but uh, at, at least you try for the majority. Uh, and, and it can be uh, such a simple thing as how do you spell the name for God in the Lenji language? The, the, the name was, uh, was, was the same, Lesa, for, uh, for the Catholics, but the Protestants put up honorific, Balesa. So they, they couldn't agree at first, how are we going to sort this out? Well, in the end, they, they agreed we would use the, the shortened uh, form, Lesa, but the Protestants, uh, when they would use it, they would just add the Va uh, honorific form. Uh, but we had to agree on that. Otherwise, uh, the project would be derail at that point. But we settled that at the beginning. And this is the, the, the process of continual testing involving as much of the community as possible along the way. And hopefully, uh, the spirit is going to work through that translation and bring agreement at the end of the day that they will feel comfortable in using it in as many churches as possible. Thank you so much. Daniel, I have two questions lined up for you. We just want to check in. I see you are here. Please give us another snippet, please, before your connection plays tricks with us. I I work with IMTOUT as an initiative for mother tongue and language development. It is one of the Bible translation organizations I chance with um, the seed company here in the South. I serve as a programs manager. I collect quarterly a quarterly and narrative reports and then forward them to the appropriate channels. I also write uh, proposals for upcoming uh, projects like the o o oral Bible story for Bibleized um, languages here in Cross River State and also like for now we are trying to get we've already some I've already submitted a proposal for the Agua cluster. And then we are now working on getting information for five other languages. Thank you so much. As before, we've just had a snippet there. Um, thanks, Annie. Uh, da Reverend Daniel, two questions for you. The one is, are we not neglecting Bible translation in the Francophone areas? You are surrounded by the Francophone areas, mostly Muslim, so you're in a good position to answer that. And then there's a specific question <coughs> from Matthew Harley. Could you, Daniel, please ex expand a little more on how you think the process of internalization can be incorporated better? in the process of written Bible translation. So we're putting you on the spot, first French, and then internalization. Could you help us, please? Uh, could you permit me to refer that question on the French translation to my professor, Dr. Linnell, because uh, she is living among the, uh, she's living in a Francophone country, and she's been involved in a fr uh, translation in those countries. So I think she has better information than, than me. Now, to reward you for that clever trick, I'm going to ask you another question. Catherine says, uh, white as snow doesn't work where she was a missionary in, uh, in Sudan. So what alternatives do you have? So you have internalization and white as milk. Is that OK for Bible translation? Very good. Uh, for that, um, I would uh, first of all, as a translation consultant, ask the team, uh, as white as snow, is a figure of speech. Um, you know, there, there is this uh, tendency to always remove figures of speech uh, from, uh, from the Bible simply because uh, we do not have another way of expressing it, and then we do not have the, uh, the, 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 the things that are used to do those illustrations. And uh, at the end of the day, it's like uh, we are just trying to produce uh, text without uh, uh, figurative expressions, metaphors, uh, similes, and all of that. Um, the Africa, African languages have lots and lots of uh, metaphors. And uh, the fact that uh, that language does not have uh, the idea of snow they might have a different way of expressing the idea that snow is giving in that context. So the best thing would be for them to, first of all, understand the meaning, the idea that that text is uh, trying to tell us, and then find another suitable 
uh, figure of whether a metaphor or a simile or any other uh, figure of speech that uh, can be used in that context. Uh, so it's difficult to be able to give the answer and say they can say it this way, but it's good to research, do a kind of a cultural research and find what is equivalent to the idea that uh, that uh, uh, a figure of speech is is given there. So that is uh, what I would say uh, concerning that. Thank you so much. Can I just then also, just a general disclaimer, dear friends, you're welcome to post any comment and question. Obviously, time is limited, so we do not promise that we can get to all of them. Prof. Adams, would you give attention to the quite lengthy one of Francis Umondi? But I'll first go to Dr. Linnell. Uh, the question was about uh, uh, progress with Bible translation in Francophone African countries. Could you give us a picture there, please? Okay, but before I do that, I would like to speak to what Daniel just said. Um, in, many, uh, in many African languages, we have a special linguistic form called an idiophone. And these idiophones, in that particular verse, in something white as snow or something <clears throat> so shiny, I know in Godier, if we say Jesus's um, being became so he's all bright white and um, much has been, we can exploit what are in African languages when we don't have an equivalent of a, a known item such as snow. So as concerning the progress in Francophone Africa, um, it, as I noted, it has been very, very slow because um, actually the colonial powers, uh, beginning with the Portuguese and going through the French, were very um, uh, a negative to mother tongue speech. And even in my husband's time, if you are in a classroom and you utter a word in your mother tongue, you will be punished and humiliated publicly for using your mother tongue when you should be speaking French. So these colonial attitudes have, um, and different other historical factors, have meant that in Francophone Africa, the progress has been very slow. Bible translation started very late and um, churches have been slow to catch on to the importance of Bible translation in evangelism. However, the news for me and what I've seen in my career and now that I'm retired is very, very, very encouraging. And this is because um, a lot has been done to train. There's been training programs in Abidjan at Fatiak in French. There are some training programs in Cameroon. We do workshops. And also in Jerusalem, um, uh, five month programs have been given to Francophones. And um, coming up in October, I'll be teaching. I guess 13 African Francophones and we'll be doing narrative Jonah and poetic Psalms and learning the discourse of these. So there's a lot of learning going on. And I will say about four years ago, I was invited to Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. And we actually had a hundred where I never even, when I began, I never knew a francophone consultant, though there might have been one or two coming from Europe. When I went to this conference in Burkina Faso, we had a participation of 100 people, and almost all of those were Africans who were consultants in training. So this is why the key is not only to multiply projects, but the real key is to train Africans to be the consultants 
and to uh, move ahead. And it's, I'm very, very, very encouraged by the progress. Thank you for the response, and it's really good to hear. Uh, we are wrapping up. Um, Prof. Um, Ernst, you've seen Kenan Umondi's question there. It's quite, quite a, a big one. So uh, if you've summarized that and just respond, uh, Daniel, Reverend Daniel, I'll come to you and allow the pulpit to you to make an altar call to, to just tell us why we all need to do more in Bible translation. And then we'll pass to a senior academic, my colleague, Dr. Modisa Mazondi, to summarize and to thank you guys and to close in a prayer. Uh, um, uh, Prof. Ernst, uh, just a response to Kenan Omondi, please. Yes, I agree 100% with the two observations there, the, the diminishing use of mother tongue among Africans who are uh, in our part of the world using English, especially in the major cities. And then the younger generation that uh, is being educated uh, largely in English, uh, that is uh, uh, has an effect too. So what should we do? What can we do in this case? I already um, uh, mentioned the the use uh, and um, encouragement of study Bibles, where you have the text of uh, uh, the modern translation or the uh, older translation, or I, I, if possible, a diglot, the older a missionary translation plus a, a meaning-based translation. And then at the bottom of the page, notes that are written by African scholars that will, uh, will focus on the issues of the text as they relate to African life and culture. So the point is not just to take a study Bible that already exists, like the popular NIV study of Bible, and then translate those notes. What we did in Chichewa was to uh, have the three major drafters uh, tried to think of how the text would apply in their, uh, in their language and culture and to make use in their notes of uh, idioms, figures of speech, uh, idiophones, as were mentioned, uh, to make the mes message of the commentary actually live and attract readers, uh, it, not only to the biblical text, but also to their, uh, their mother tongue and language. What happened was when we finished the New Testament, the notes, we had so many notes from uh, the producers that we had to cut them back by two thirds. And so only a, about a third of the notes got included in the Chichewa uh, uh, study Bible for the New Testament. But those notes that were remaining could have produced the, top, the commentaries that he was uh, referring to. I suggested that to the Bible Society of Malawi, that they would take these notes and produce these mini, uh, mini commentaries. Some of them, the notes for a particular book like the Gospels, uh, came to about 100 pages. This would be the, the commentaries that would be so needed to help, especially uh, people in rural areas who do not have access to English or resources of a theological or biblical nature. But uh, a lot of emphasis has to be given to this and support. And uh, that's another issue. Where is the support going to come in terms of finances and also the scholars that are going to produce these notes? I struggled for 15 years on this. I didn't solve it, but uh, it, it stands as a challenge for uh, not only in Africa, but in many other regions of the world to produce these, uh, uh, these, these translations with extended notes. And that would be one way to uh, uh, deal with problems one and two, as mentioned uh, by Reverend Omonde. Thanks so much. Uh, Linnell posted something in addition to the comment on the progress with Francophone uh, projects. Uh, Reverend Daniel, I also had a reminder from Matthew Hartley to ask, could you just say one thing about the place of internalization in Bible translation? And then any, um, if you hear, we're going to hear your voice one last time. But uh, Daniel, if you want to respond and start your altar call for more Bible translation. Translators, welcome. Yeah, um, the temptation for uh, a written back translator usually is to uh, have a look at the text. Um, for example, a verse in a chapter, and then the translator might think, okay, I understand what 
what it means, and then he begins to write it in his uh, mother tongue. Now, the challenge is that that translator may not have understood clearly what that text means. Now, in the uh, oral translation, the internalization process requires that you listen to the whole set. You have to be patient and listen to the whole set, which might be maybe half of a chapter or maybe a whole chapter or a number of verses. It has to be a complete discourse. Then after listening, you, you are not satisfied, you are not clear yet, you have to listen to it again and again, and then it begins to form a message, you begin to get what it actually says, then isolate difficult concepts, discuss them in a team. It's not just something that one person is doing. After discussing it in a team, then the next thing is that the whole team needs to come together and dramatize it. However it is, they can do, dramatize it just to be able to pass the message the way they understand it. So that internalization process has always proven to be very helpful because uh, it makes them to have the message right within them. Uh, it's not like uh, looking at the text and then translate, but then they have to have everything within them. It's more or less like uh, uh, they are memorizing it, uh, but not just memory, mem memorizing it, but uh, understanding it, the, the, the sequence of events, understanding it in that way, and dramatizing it, and then the next thing would be to say it out loud and uh, record it. Uh, the process where one will just look at a portion and begin to write, uh, it, it, it sometimes uh, uh, translators carry over things that are peculiar to the source text and bring them into the target uh, language, which may not, which may obscure the meaning of uh, the text that they're translating. But uh, patiently listening and dramatizing, uh, following the sequence of events as in maybe a story text, um, uh, understanding it from that perspective uh, in a way that people can even dramatize it, 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 it stays more in their minds to be able to explain it even anywhere they go. So it's not just a kind of a, uh, uh, writing it in the text and then they are forgotten about what they have written. Thank so you so much. That is what I've been thinking that is good to improve on uh, internalization, bringing that into uh, reading. Uh, Thank you so discussion. much. Thank yeah. you so much, dear Reverend Daniel. I'm going to pass the microphone and hopefully also the camera to my colleague, Dr. Mazondi. Uh, please tell us of your involvement in Bible translation, Dr. Mazondi, and then please thank our audience and um, our panelists especially and uh, close our meeting for us. Thank you. Over to you. Dr. Modisa, are you there? Yes, I am here. Good good afternoon, colleagues. I hope my camera would not disappoint me. Let me know if the picture is showing. We see the white wall uh, behind, and I believe it's you in front of it. So that helps. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, my name is Modisa Mzondi. I'm one of the lecturers here at SATS, and I'm also the deputy president of the White Leaf South Africa Bible Translation Organization. At the Weight Leaf, where we are mainly involved in or what we call OBT, oral Bible translation, in the Southern African region and in some Lusophone countries. We are currently involved uh, in translation project, which have just started in the country in South Africa. We're looking into Sipulana uh, in Lesotho and Sipu, Siputi in Lesotho and Sipulana in Limpopo, which are new translation that we're going to be using in oral Bible translation. What we do is that we translate the Bible in oral form, uh, and uh, some some other translation are uh, selected session in in written form for people who've never had a Bible in their in their mother tongue all the time. So that's what we're doing here in Waitley, South Africa, Bible translation. And um, I was quite thrilled to hear that uh, Dr. Zoko also has an, has a, a continuous experience with Waitley. Uh, Bible translation, so she would understand what, uh, what we're doing, as well as uh, Reverend uh, Daniel Gia would also understand what we're doing. So, of late years, that in the past two years, there's, there has been a collaboration between the Bible Society of South Africa, Word Alive, 
Wait for Life, uh, Biblica and Waitley South Africa to collaborate and the four organizations have uh, created what we call the Bible Translation Collaborative. And we are working together in areas of Bible translation and supporting each other. And uh, we have reached a memorandum of understanding between the, the four of us that those we will uh, those who are involved in written Bible translation will continue to do so. Uh, ourselves who are involved in all our Bible translation will continue to do so and will support each other. And that is the latest development here in Southern Africa in terms of uh, oral Bible translation and written Bible translation. Thank to you, uh, Professor Wendland, Dr. Zogbo, uh, Reverend Gia and Mrs. Williams for all your contribution and eye-opening discussion in the area of Bible translation. It is indeed a very ongoing Bible uh, project, which is uh, demanding, which needs a lot of funding, which needs also a lot of, uh, lot of uh, personnel. At the moment here in, at Wakelift, we are training translators who could be turned uh, into some form of uh, semi-consultants uh, in collaboration with an institution here so that they can help us to further the work of translation. The, the work of Bible translation continues to be huge, to be large and demanding, and we uh, pray that God will open ways and touch others to be involved in this work and in this uh, ministry as we move ahead to ensure that uh, everyone has a word of God in his own mother tongue. Our heart and our desire at Waitlift Bible South Africa is that we have the language the Bible translated into the language of the people in their mother tongue. And we have uh, that as continuing to engage the community, continuing that to engage uh, people and churches as stakeholders. So it's a, it's a partnership of the community, the church and other stakeholders in ensuring that there is uh, Bible translation happening in areas and in communities where there are no Bible trans Bible in the mother tongue. So we also work with uh, SIL and the seed company as well, as we've had other colleagues uh, mention that there is a collaboration between uh, SIL and the seed company, which are also driving uh, organizations uh, globally in terms of uh, contributing to the work of Bible translation. So thank you colleagues for being present and may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, give you peace and open doors for you so that the work of Bible translation in your area may continue to enrich and expand the kingdom of God. Over to you, Dr. Malhelbe. Thank you. Thank you so Shall much. Uh, yes, please. Can I also thank the audience for bearing with us with the technical challenges and for all of you for helping us to reprioritize in terms of supporting. It's a high priority for SETS and you guys would help us make do that even better. Uh, Dr. Medisa, please close in a word of prayer and then thank you to all of you. We thank you Lord and praise you for your work and all the deliberations that we've had about the continuation work and continuing work of Bible translation in the continent. We pray, Lord, that you open doors. We pray, Lord, that you bring um, necessary resources that we need in terms of finance and personnel. And Lord, we pray that we be able to reach many people in our communities who would not have the weight in their own mother tongue. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and bless us all as we move and go to our different destinations. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.